Good evening, everyone. My name is Emily and I'm with the Miami University Alumni Association. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our virtual wine tasting with Jack Keegan. Tonight is a special Thursday edition of our regular wine tastings because it is Move in Miami, our annual day of giving, honoring the incoming class. So our goal today was to get 2,027 gifts in 20 hours and 27 minutes in honor of the class of 2027. And while we reached that goal, we of um, getting 2,027 gifts with the help of so many generous donors, we are still working to raise more funds. Um, and I think we will be for like the next eight or so hours until 2, 27 a.m. this morning. So there's still time to get your donation in. Um, there are over 200 project pages with different ways that you can support Miami students, different organizations on campus, scholarships, um, and different projects that need to be funded. Um, so you can make that gift on www.moveinmiami.org. Um, before we get started, a quick intro um, on Jack, although I'm sure most of you know who he is by now. Um, Jack is an instructor emeritus who taught the ever popular viticulture and enology class at Miami. He also posted this past week on Facebook that he has worked at Miami for um, 45 years now. So congrats, Jack. Um, and he will continue that streak this fall semester as he is teaching another class starting next week. Um, so for those of you that were lucky enough to get into his class while at Miami, while at Miami, I'm sure these tastings bring back fun memories. And for those of you that didn't take it, this is now your chance. Um, so just a quick reminder that live viewers can use the ask a question box located on the bottom of the screen. I'll monitor these throughout um, the tasting and relay them to Jack. And with that being said, go ahead and take it away, Jack. Thank you, Emily. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as I said, or in fact, if you notice another thing, of course, it's Andale, Andale, Miami. So in other words, move it, move it is certainly the one we're looking for there. And so that, in fact, what we're talking about tonight. As you also know, when I do these tastings, because why should we wait? The first thing we will do, in fact, is have a wine. Uh, this is our wine list, as usual. Uh, as you can see here, unfortunately on the monitor, I can't see it very well. Uh, the Montes Classic Chardonnay, actually I could probably look at the bottles right next to me, that would probably be smart. Uh, the uh, 2021 Casero de Diablo, Reserva Rosé, uh, and then the Alta Vista Viva Malbec, the Norton 1895 Cabernet Sauvignon, and then Carmenere, and uh, also then Syrah, which is two grapes that you may not have had quite as much in there. So that's what we're doing with that. The first wine we're going to do is, of course, going to be the Monte Chardonnay. And I think it's good to have something to drink while we're talking. And so, in fact, I've already opened it. It actually comes as a screw cap. And I'm going to pour this Montes. Montes Alpha, uh, a very, very major company uh, down there in Chile. Uh, you can see in front of the Central Valley. Um, one thing you'll notice about this wine, I hope you can see the color okay. Oh, yeah, it's fine. Um, is, in fact, it's a, it's a nice golden color. Um, in fact, very, you know, sort of very nice, um, uh, a little darker than a lot of Chardonnays, but Chardonnays typically see some oak. Uh, and so we'll swirl this wine and smell it. Mm, pears right away. Oh, spice pears. You know, there's some spiciness to that wine also. Really so nice. Oh, yeah, and the spice continues to come up. Uh, with that. Mm, so nice. Some apples there too. So lots of nice fruit flavors in this wine. And I may be getting just a little hint of that butteriness, that vanilla that you'll get off the oak. So let's taste this wine. Mm, nice, crisp, clean. You do get a little more of that butteriness in the flavor, but certainly, again, that spice pear, so it really handles very well. One thing you might notice, I'm not sure if I mention it all the time, but when I taste the wine, it's one of the things that I always have trouble sort of explaining or showing in class, is that what I'll do is take a sip, not too much, otherwise you'll choke, uh, and then pull a little air across that wine. Because by doing so, you have in fact increased the number, the amount of molecules, in other words, the flavor compounds, the aromas in that wine to go up to your nose. So you can really get a wonderful full flavor or of, of the aromas of that wine. Because let's face it, 
your your tongue can only taste very few things, sweet, salt, bitter, a couple others too, uh, where in fact, everything else, all those other flavors actually come from the aromas in the wine. And so that's why it's so important to get a, a, you know, a good mouthfeel and get that air moving across that. And it is, boy. Spice Paris has a nice long finish. Um, I don't taste this wine a, a bit ago, and it's really nice. It's, uh, again, maybe possibly because it's the first wine, and I could look later, it's a slightly hot, but it is alcohol 14%. And so for white, eh, that's not unusual. Uh, could be a little bit lower. I felt a little bit of heat in my throat, in fact, as I drink that wine. So that's what, in fact, I'm noticing on this wine with it. And we'll talk a lot about these companies, etc. Oh, nice. It's almost floral coming out now, too. But that butteriness, that pears, a nice wine to start with. Just really is nice for a sort of crazy day as it's been here in Oxford. As you can see, there it is, the Montes Alta. Alta. We're talking, of course, about Chile. Uh, you can see it there along the line. Tremendously long country. Literally, it is as long as if you were to go from New York to L.A., just to give you an idea about how, in fact, long this country is. Average width, only about 110 miles. Uh, and so that certainly makes a lot of difference er, er, with this. And in fact, many of the areas are extremely dry and rely on irrigation, in fact, from the Andes, because of course the Andes form the spine between the two countries, Chile and Argentina, there to the south. And they are, by the way, by far the largest producers of wine in South America. Here, in fact, is another picture uh, for you to see of the various areas. Um, you can see it's broken up, but this is actually in the central uh, valley, uh, where you can see, in fact, it's broken down to four or five different areas. The reason being is by making it central valley, which is basically the designation, they can get the grapes from any of those regions. And so this is why typically the smaller the area, you know, the more expensive the wine is. I mean, if you get a wine simply from... Uh, Napa County, for example, it's going to be less expensive than Napa Valley. And then, of course, if you get it from Oakville or if you get it from Yonville or or any of the other, Rutherford, any of the other parts in, in Napa, they're going to be more expensive. And it's the same way with this. And so there's a wonderful entry-level wine done by Montes that they do a very, very nice job on. Uh, this, in fact, is the beautiful, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the beautiful uh, winery that's there. In fact, there's a number of you know, wonderful wineries down in Chile, and we'll talk a little about the history of the wines, etc. in there. Uh, this, again, beautiful pictures of the hillsides and the vineyards. I've always wanted to go. In fact, I was talking to, in fact, a producer from Chile, Argentina. I would love to go and visit these areas because they really are quite, quite lovely. They're very extensive barrel room uh, at the winery also. So very, very neat uh, to see. Here's another picture, in fact, of the vineyards uh, that are there. I was trying to, I only have one picture because you realize, as we, of course, sweltered today, and we'll talk a little bit about the thunderstorm that we had this morning in Oxford, and then luckily it did not get as warm, but the humidity is through the roof, and so it feels like 98 degrees in Oxford today. So it's nice being in some air conditioning and tasting a cool glass of wine uh, there, but there it's winter, and so, in fact, they're going through. In fact, they will, we're going into fall. They will soon be going into spring. And so they did their harvest in March, typically. And so this is the difference because we are in the Southern Hemisphere. Whoops. Let's see if I can get this to move properly. Oh, come on. There we go. Another nice picture. Of course, you can see the plants turning beautiful, beautiful colors there in the fall. So it's sort of interesting. So again, technical data, it's 100% Chardonnay. It is from the Central Valley. Uh, pH 3.21 probably doesn't mean much to you, but that's a good pH. It's nice and low, uh, and that makes the wine, that gives the wine that's crispness, its acidity there also. As you can see, the acidity there too, alcohol 14%. And as I'm not surprised, 30% of the wine is kept for six to eight months in first, second, or third use French oak barrels. That's where you're getting that butteriness from. That's where you're getting that toastiness that's there. And so it's that spice pear. Probably some of the spice flavors are also, in fact, coming from that oak, not just from the Chardonnay. <clears throat> Chardonnay is an interesting grape simply because it is fairly, well, it's malleable. And so you can do pretty much whatever with it. It doesn't have a lot of really strong flavors, say like Cabernet does or Riesling does or Sauvignon Blanc. And so Winemakers get to play a lot more. And of course, as you know, um, 
20 years ago, maybe even less, all Chardonnays were oaked, uh, very much like this one is. But today we have a number of oaked, or they've dialed back a lot of the uh, Chardonnay oakiness that's there. And so you find a lot of fresher ones. I really like the ones that go very well uh, with food, with having a little less oak. Um, and of course, the pattern for Chardonnay are white burgundies. And so, in fact, I like white burgundies, Chablis, Puy Fuisse, places like that. Wonderful, crisp, wonderful Chardonnays that are just, just great wines. Okay. So that's our first wine there. Um, it was given 90 points, at least the 21 was. The lemon pastry, and bre bread crust, again, there's that butteriness they're talking about, butter and ripe melon, full-bodied buttery Chardonnay with creamy, medium acidity, and some pastries in the finish. Certainly very true. This was for the 21, but the 20 certainly is in that same uh, vein. And so that's, in fact, what you're seeing there. So very, very nice wine. Um, some pictures. Let's see. Why is this moving? Um, some things that are going on. You know, I always do things in the world of wine. And one of the first things we find is verasion. Verasion, again, you don't have to in English have the, um, have the accent, but I picked this off of the um, uh, a website uh, for, from people, in fact, who are from France, but have a place in California. And so they, of course, would put the accent on it. Verasion is when the grapes turn color. And this, of course, just shows you a beautiful bunch of grapes. And so Verasion is happening with a lot of the red grape varieties at the moment in California. In fact, it's interesting, a couple of things. One is that it's actually, even though, you know, Texas and Southern California and so many places in the United States have been sweltering. As you know, July was the hottest month in the world. Um, California wasn't that way. They are actually a, probably a couple weeks later than a normal harvest. And from what the indications say, this is 2023 is going to be a stellar vintage in California because of that longer growing season. So it's going to be really interesting to see how all of this works. So that is Verasion, though in fact, uh, there are in fact uh, some grapes being picked. This is, in fact, harvest starts in Napa. I got this off of the Napa thing. This is at saint Superi, uh, And this, not surprisingly, is Sauvignon Blanc. Whites are typically picked earlier than reds. Uh, and so they picked, I think, 14 tons that day is what they had said. And so there's a picture of the Sauvignon Blanc that is there. Uh, another picture that I'm really so glad to go, get, this is Pinot Meunier. Pinot Meunier is one of the grapes. It's a really a clone or a different kind of Pinot Noir. And it is it goes into sparkling wine production. Uh, at Stoller, Evan Rose, who is the winemaker now at Stoller uh, at the moment, he uh, is a Miami alum and sent me this picture. And the reason, of course, he picked it so early, or they picked these Meunier so early, is because, in fact, it will go into their sparkling wine production, which is really pretty neat. I was just really glad to get that picture. Uh, so that I could show you. In fact, though it's funny, someone looked at this picture on my phone, and you may think the same thing. They thought originally it was blackberries because you can see how tight those clusters are. It's just sort of amazing to see. But that's very typical of Pinot because, in fact, they think that the word Pinot came from Pinot, in other words, like pine cones. Uh, and in fact, is where the name came from. So it was really neat to see, and I was really glad that Evan sent that uh, sent that picture to me so I could share it with you. Uh, in fact, tonight. Uh, and uh, again, another person who worked in Luxembourg when I was there uh, sent me these pictures, in fact, from this week uh, uh, in Luxembourg of the grapevines. And so I had to thank Claudine for that. So that was very nice of her. She sent me pictures. I used them in class all the time. And so it really is great to see that. And so those of you, in fact, I know there's a fundraiser. In fact, I gave money to MUDEC today. Uh, and so um, it's a, a fundraiser sort of going on. So it was great to see these pictures or these grapes, in fact, from Luxembourg uh, there. And can you believe this? Finland? I, it still blows my mind. Um, Finland and Latvia are the only two countries in the European Union who grow no grapes. Well, that is changing. This is actually a picture of a vineyard in Finland, and they, in fact, are starting to move. And of course, you know, climate change, all those things going on. And they actually have to bury these vines to get them through the cold Finnish winters so far. But this, in fact, was an article that I happened to find, in fact, about all of that. So I thought that was pretty interesting, in fact, to see. 
know, it's interesting. I must have skipped a, a thing. This one's a little more difficult to run, so I'm going to run back a second. Yes, I did miss this. Um, just a couple other things before we get on. Um, there was, in fact, some gentlemen, they had seen how wines have been taken up from the sea and they were beautifully preserved. So they tried to do this in California. The problem is they got, you know, no, they didn't check with the government. They got no permissions. They got nothing. And so, in fact, they were fined for their underwater water storage down there, of course, hurting the ocean and all those things. So it's sort of interesting to see that that's what they were trying to do. Uh, as you all know, Hurricane hit Hillary hit Southern California. They are worried about mildew, but I was surprised some of the vineyards were actually spraying hydrogen peroxide before the rains came, and they were actually spraying raw milk to try to prevent the mildew uh, afterwards. So I thought that was interesting to see. Another thing, those of you from the New York area, Long Island wineries were celebrating their 50 years uh, as a viticultural area. And there are some very, very good, especially Merlots coming out of, um, out of uh, Long Island, uh, along with other reds for the most part. Um, one thing, of course, not so nice, the average cost of a tasting in Napa has gone up 35% in the past year. In other words, that was from, you know, basically, I guess, 21 to 22, uh, up to average, in fact, of $81, up $21. As little as now 12, 13 years ago, most places were free. And so, of course, this was going on. And, of course, COVID, you have to have appointments in many of these places now. And then the average cost of a bottle of Napa wine, in fact, the average is now going up to $108 a bottle. So uh, there are still some great bargains there. But for the most part, Napa Valley wines are very expensive. Do you have any questions, Emily? Yes, we have a couple that have come in. They're not super specific to this wine, but that's okay. Um, so Steve and Martha want to know how much use of other vessels in Chile and Argentina, and then they listed terracotta, concrete. Good question. And you're actually finding that there's probably, in fact, still a small amount, but many of the people I would think like, you know, Catena and, and some other ones, in fact, I know are using amphora. Uh, what they're talking about is, in fact, just not using oak or just not using stainless steel. Um, because, of course, you know, in the Republic of Georgia, they used, in fact, these large queveries. And, in fact, if you've ever had an orange wine, they very often are done skins and pulps. In other words, done as it was thousands of years ago. And many, many other people are using all kinds of interesting vessels for the fermentation and, in some cases, for the storage. A lot of amphoras. Uh, a lot of other very special eggs, in fact, to do the fermentation, etc. I would imagine that the percentage is probably still fairly low. It would be mainly boutique wineries or certainly for like their really high end wineries. Because many of these wineries, for example, the next wine we have, you know, makes wine, you know, in the everyday category. Uh, and then, of course, up to hundreds of dollars a bottle. And so, in fact, and some of them have more than one winery. And so they may make their fine wines in one winery, and then they may make their everyday wines in a completely separate winery uh, that may not, in fact, be next door. Uh, and so it's sort of interesting to see. But there are, in fact, um, many, many interesting changes going on. But for the most part, it's stainless steel, it's oak, or if it's concrete also lined is where are most of the fermentation vessels uh, are used. Any else? Yeah, one more. Um, Dan wants to know where you bought these wines. These wines, you've hit a sore point there, Dan. Um, the reason is, is because, and I will tell you, I try very, very hard to make this as, as much of a no-brainer for you as possible. And so I actually talked to the importer of these wines. And I knew that the importer also, in fact, had close relationship with the largest distributor here in Ohio. And so all of these wines should have been readily available in Ohio. Um, I actually talked to someone fairly high up in that company uh, complaining because you should have been able to find these wines quite easily. Co-brand, which is the people who, in fact, import these wines, are in 45 states. And none of these wines should be difficult to find. And I will flat out tell you, I apologize 
that this has happened. I had no idea. Had I known a couple of weeks earlier, I would have probably you know, gotten out my whip and started beating people uh, because this is ridiculous. But so that's the problem. You may be saying that has nothing to do with where you tried to buy the wines, but this is a problem that I found in the last day or two that did come up. And so I do apologize. It should be because they're co-brand products and co-brand is in fact in any number of states. A long-winded thing to basically tell you I was not happy. <laughs> and okay. that's all for it now. Great. So let's continue on. And with our next wine, uh, Castellano del Diablo, uh, which of course is a rosé from Conchi y Toro. And it is also a twist off cap. Pour a bit of this wine. Great color. It really is just a, a really wonderful, a little bit more than sort of skin tone pink uh, to it. Might have just a little bit of what the French would call eau de perdu, in other words, partridge eye of all things. Uh, there, it has a little bit of that going on. Uh, a little, not really brown, but sort of more that way uh, in there. Uh, in beautiful color though. And of course, if you swirl and smell this wine, the first thing that, me, that comes up is a spiciness. There's a really nice spice to this wine and strawberries. I think more than anything else, I don't really get much in the way of, you know, sort of peach or anything like that. Maybe some apple. Again, more strawberries, maybe raspberries. Nice fresh fruit aromas. Wonderful. And of course, very typical for a good rosé. And of course, you taste this wine. Mm -mm. In some ways, I decided I wouldn't switch them because it's not so bad. Um, it could almost have been first. It's brighter. It's crisper than the first wine. Has more acid. No question about that. Um, and so, uh, and so, it really could be. It's really very much an aperitif. Bright, light, fresh fruit um, would go really well with a number of cheeses. I can think of things like goat cheese. I just finished making this thing. Was it took yogurt? No, actually, it was cream cheese and goat cheese, and you baked it, and then made strawberries with a um, uh, a bit of uh, balsamic vinegar and put it over top. And I was thinking how well this would go, in fact, with that. That was, it was, was really turned out very nicely. So it would, but I can think of any number of things that this would be really nice with. And even, you know, I can, certainly fish, certainly no problem, in fact, with light pasta dishes, maybe even pesto, uh, because again, nice and light and bright, I think would be fine. Uh, so yeah, it's that time of year. Nice wine, nice wine. Some things about this wine, um, again, Drink Chile. This is, in fact, from them. Uh, this, in fact, is Conchi Toro. Conchi Toro was founded, and, you know, we think about these com companies, and, and many of them, in fact, have not been on the market. Conchi Toro certainly has been on the market in the United States for a long time, but they were founded in 1883. Uh, and, in fact, they are the fifth largest wine company in the world, uh, making over 15 million cases which is really pretty amazing to think about uh, in all of this. Uh, this, of course, is their old cellar, again, founded in 18, um, in 1883. Uh, in this, they, in fact, probably, in fact, for the last number of years, they have been the second, what, in fact, from wine statistics, tell me they are the second most powerful wine brand in the world. And so what I decided to do is, in fact, we'll, I'll leave it, in fact, for later. In fact, maybe after we taste all the wines, I will, you can chat at, tell Emily who you think is number one. No cheating. Uh, and you can, in fact, find, but I thought that was an interesting statistic. In fact, it made me look. I didn't know. Uh, and so it was sort of interesting to see that. So it is, in fact, with that. So it's interesting. Also, the other thing that's really neat about this wine, if you have it, or I can put it up there, of course, it's, Castellero del Diablo. Well, even if you don't speak Spanish, you certainly know that Diablo is the devil. Well, where did this wine get its name from? Here, uh, Don Melchior, who in fact was the founder of Conchitoro, he 
kept finding, even though his cellar was supposedly locked, that many of his fine wines kept disappearing. So what he decided to do was, in fact, put out, I don't know exactly how he did this, but he put out the rumor that, in fact, the, the cellar was haunted by the devil. And so consequently, this went out to the townspeople. And from what I understand, the theft stopped. So it's sort of interesting that he would use that, in fact, to do. So, of course, this name has, in fact, stuck in, for a very, very long time in all of that. So it's really sort of interesting to think about that. The other thing, in fact, I can't remember if I, if I have a picture. No, of course, look at this beautiful countryside. And of course, the Andes in the background also. Um, and I thought I left myself a, a note. I guess I didn't. But here, I was looking at the history. In 2010, very, very smart people. They actually are now in a uh, an agreement with Manchester United, the football or soccer uh, English team, uh, because in fact, they also use the demons, the red demons. And so they have a thing with them to sort of market the wines, which is one reason why this is in fact a wine you will find in many, many countries. And in fact, is extremely popular. I'm sure that a good 10 million of the 15 million cases they have is probably of the various Castellero de Diablos uh, of the wine. So it's sort of really interesting, in fact, to see with all of that. Look at these beautiful vineyards. And of course, if you're making that much, you have to, in fact, own thousands of acres of vineyards to, in fact, be able to do this. Beautiful countryside. Just makes you want to go and visit them in there. There it is, the Castello del Diablo. Uh, and so this is, in fact, a picture of the, of the gate into the door. So I thought it was really pretty neat, uh, in fact, to see. I thought, too, um, I would talk a little bit about Chilean wine history. Uh, of course, it started with the Spanish. The missions came. It was not very long. In fact, they brought the grape, the Criolla, or sometimes called Pais. Uh, also, of course, here in California, we call it the mission grape, was one of the first ones brought by the Spanish. The thing about it is it's easy to grow. It's very high yielding. It gives you wine that are eh, not that good, but it's wine. And of course, you know, the Spanish being Christian, they needed wine for mass, etc. So in fact, this was in fact very important. But look at that. I mean, the first vineyard in 1548, I mean, nothing in America was even thought of at that period of time in there. The other thing, of course, it's gone back and forth because, of course, it's very far. Before, um, it, has, it has, in fact, what is called a, it's interesting, even though Chile is Spanish, many of their, um, their wine people, in fact, not being stupid, went to France and brought over French viticulturists and other experts in wine from there. In fact, they planted what is called, was called a quinta, quinta is typically a Portuguese word for vineyard, a quinta normal. Um, and, and I looked and looked and looked for pictures of this. I think in fact it was gone because in fact, they are now going to build a, 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 a quinta, in other words, a vineyard in the park where in fact the original probably was. So I thought that was just really fascinating to think about how all of that happened in there. And they brought these grapes like in the 1840s. Well, phylloxera hit Europe. Phylloxera, by the way, in case you don't know, is basically an insect, we call it a root louse, and it eats the root, it takes and sucks all the juice out of the thing and kills the plant. It caused literally billions and billions of dollars of damage in Europe. And so, and here in Chile, they've never had phylloxera. And they've had some other things, but so they can have vines that are not grafted, which is what you do to prevent phylloxera. And so it's sort of really interesting along those, you know, those lines. Interestingly enough, too, they were a major importer to America pre-prohibition. I had no idea. But then, of course, between the World Wars, obviously, you know, you could not ship anywhere. And then, of course, various political peoples. Um, Literally, except for maybe Santa Carolina or Conchi Toro, you never saw Chilean wines here in America. And then starting in the late 90s, partially under the Pinochet regime, all of a sudden, and then, you know, they had, again, foreign money going in there from Spain, like the Domex, the Torres people, also um, the French uh, investing money. And so all of a sudden, wonderful uh, Chilean wines came on the market. 
So it's really interesting, in fact, to see how that history, in fact, has done with all of this. And so really, really a major importer in there. Uh, by the way, uh, Chile, in fact, probably has about 400,000 acres of grapes. Uh, they also have about 100,000 acres of table grapes, because when you get table grapes in the wintertime, you are probably getting them, in fact, from Chile. The other thing is they have about 24,000 acres of grapes that go into Pisco. Pisco is a brandy type wine, extremely, excuse me, brandy type spirits, extremely important in South America. And in fact, is now making some inroads into the American market. If you go to South America, you typically have a Pisco sour. Uh, and so the Chile has tremendous amount of growth when it comes to grapes. Uh, this, in fact, was the gentleman, uh, Silvestre uh, Ochegravia, who, in fact, brought over those grapes there for the first people. In fact, their winery, that winery, is still in existence uh, under his name. Uh, interesting also, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get there, um, is this grape. This is Carmenere. Carmenere is a grape that had grown, you know, for a very short period, for a very long time, um, uh, in in France. Uh, and here it came to Chile and no one knew it was there until about 20, 25 years ago. And so it's become very much, but we'll talk about that later because we're going to have a common here a bit later. Okay. Any questions, Emily? Yes, we have one question. So someone said we had a white Pinot Noir from the Willamette valley over the summer they told us that the harvested from 2020 was ruined from the wildfires they found that they could peel the grapes and use the inside to make a white pinot noir it was unique and delicious do you need, do you know anything about this wow um and that is interesting the problem ends up being is and in fact it's funny you should mention it because i'm i am in fact um but now that harvest is starting he's probably going to be really visit busy um i've had I have a former student who is wanting to do some work and he wanted, in fact, some smoke tainted wines. And I know, in fact, that some people I know in uh, Oregon have, in fact, some wines that have smoke taint. And of course, it gives them the flavor. The thing is, is and that's really interesting because typically the, the compound from the smoke would be on the skins. And so they probably, in fact, you know, obviously it would take them forever to peel the grapes, but what they did right away was they just did a complete press. And because remember, all of the color in almost every grape, there are a few exceptions, almost all the color in every grape is all in the skins. One of the things I do in class is, in fact, while listening to the song, peel me a grape, I have the students peel a grape because then they see all the colors in the skin. The inside of a grape is white, and so the juice is white. And so yes, you can make a a you can make a, a a blanc, a Pinot Noir blanc, a Cabernet Sauvignon blanc, a Malbec blanc. You can make a white wine out of any red grape practically, because as long as you press it fast and don't allow the color to come out of the skins by doing a gentle pressing, this is in fact what you can do. And I've had a number of them that can be very good. And it is, you know. When Mother Nature gives you lemons, you make lemonade. And so this is what they did in many cases. A lot of people, in fact, were not able to do that or, you know, there was too much smoke taint. And so a lot of people, in fact, did not do this. Uh, by the way, you know, it's the same way everywhere. It was interesting with these 2020 wines, many of the wines we're having tonight for 2020. And in fact, I think it was, in fact, it was the description of the Chardonnay. He was actually talking about this, of course, when COVID was every place. And so he was talking about how much more it was difficult to harvest because when people were outside, it was okay. But when you brought the grapes into the winery and then people were close and it was an enclosed place, all those extra precautions they had to put in to, of course, prevent people from getting COVID. And so, you know, I certainly had never, it didn't cross my mind that there was one more way that, you know, COVID wreaked havoc with something else. And so, in fact, it did at those points with all of that. So it's sort of really interesting to see. So, yeah, it, you know, the smoke taint will continue to be a real problem. Thankfully, knock on wood, here we are at the end of August and, and um, California has been fine. And con considering the amount of rain that they had over the winter, um, they probably have a lot of dry tinder places. So they've been, in fact, extremely lucky. 
uh, with that. So hopefully, in fact, everyone will be that way also. Though already, of course, poor British Columbia, um, I don't know how close it's gotten to the Okanagan Valley, but of course the, 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 fi the, the, the fires in, Cali in Canada have just been terrible, just absolutely terrible. Okay. Okay, and then one more about this yeah. wine. Um, are rosés less common in South American wines? Good question. Yes, I would think for the most part. The problem ends up being is, and in fact, if you look at, and, and certainly I don't have them all on the top of my head, but both Chile and Argentina are red wine producing countries. And red wines are typically more expensive. And so often you make more money. Um, though they are, we'll talk about, in fact, the thing about Chile, especially, well, in fact, Argentina also, very, very high altitude vineyards. In many cases, three, four, five, six thousand feet above sea level. And of course, what that does too is gives the grapes a lot of color uh, also. And so you're right. I don't see a lot of rosés. Probably will continue. In fact, it's interesting because, you know, we certainly sort of come on the rosé bandwagon here in the United States, but it's nothing in comparison to France. France sells a lot more rosé per capita than we do. Uh, and they make rosés everywhere. In fact, the Spanish make great rosados. Uh, you can have uh, really wonderful rosés from lots of different places. Um, interestingly enough, and I think I don't actually have a whole lot on this wine, I even wrote Conchitoro because I found, you know, they're, um, they have a, you know, usually I find tech sheets. They don't tell me what grape this is. You know, and I have no idea for sure what these grapes could be. My guess was, in fact, they are probably reds with very, very short skin contact, mainly because of the spiciness that's in the grape, et cetera. But do I know? <sighs> no, I don't. Uh, and they didn't bother writing me back to tell me uh, because it would be interesting to know. And in fact, even the, you know, as I said, their tech sheet, they had say a lot of pretty things, but they don't give me the information, in fact, that I want. Oh, well, c'est la vie. That's the way it works sometimes. So it's sort of interesting. Okay? Yep, that's it for this one. Excellent. You will continue. Whoops. Talk too fast, Jack. Um, again, we're talking, this is a Viva Classic Malbec from Alta Vista. Uh, and of course, we're in Mendoza, Argentina. So again, this wine is... Oh, no, that's right. I did this right. Took me a second. It's like, oh, wait, how did I do this? Uh, no, I just have to find my corkscrew. <laughs> Things have been a little crazy today, just in case you didn't know. Uh, and so I'm working on it. It's here someplace. Oh, there it is. Gee. Um, one thing, in fact, because in fact, <laughs> I was in a friend's house not very long ago, and and I was I was giving them a little bit of grief because they were taking the entire capsule off of the bottle. And you know from previous ones, I don't like that. John Dome, if you took the wines class from John Dome, all we said it made the bottle look naked, and I could not agree with him more. You know, they put the capsule on there. You might as well leave it on while you're enjoying the wine. So you simply take the top off. In fact, this one's plastic. There at the top. And of course, I love my waiter's corkscrew. That's what I use all the time. I don't need any other kind. As I said, though, very often I'll put the worm in straight, right in the middle, and then turn it up like so. So it has a good, hopefully has a good grip onto the cork. One up. And the second one. And voila. Great sound, right? Just amazing. So let's look at this wine. Ooh, nice dark color. Really does. You can hardly see through it at all. In fact, gee, I don't really have a whole lot of white here. Oh, no. Yeah, it gets opaque very, very quickly. So it's a lot of color. And very often, that's one of the misconceptions with wine that I certainly want to disabuse your mind of. You know, I think often when we think that a wine is dark and opaque, it is necessarily gutsier, you know, bigger, etc. And while there's a tremendous amount of truth to that, I mean, look at Cabernets, uh, etc. Uh, but I think of a like a 
a good Nebbiolo, like a Barolo Barbaresco. I mean, those wines are big wines, but yet they're very cherry colored. You know, Pinot Noirs, yeah, a little lighter, more elegant, but still could have tremendous amount of 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 sort of grip to them. Uh, and so that's why, in fact, so you can't always tell because of the color, but this is very nice and very opaque. Uh, part of it, of course, because of the grape also on there. So if you swirl and smell this wine, and it's like, come on, Jack, we want to taste it. Wow. I mean, the thing about this Malbec, and that's so typical, I mean, just this amazingly grapey aroma. You know, blueberries, uh, a little bit of, uh, yeah, really just bright, almost a little floral. Dark fruits, blackberries. Mm. And a little, you know, a, 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 I don't think this wine sees any oak. So let's taste this wine. Mm -mm -mm. Really just nice and tremendous amount of fruit. Has a good amount of grip to it, though. You know, has some backbone. So it's just not, you know, just fruity and sort of like disappears. And so what's nice about that, it's not super heavy. Uh, sort of medium body would make a great barbecue wine. You know, right away I think, oh, something off the grill. Something, you know, because you don't want a real heavy red in the summertime. Decent amount of alcohol. This one also I notice, and of course I know at the back, but I'll still look at the bottom back to see, in fact, how much uh, in there. A little bit of cocoa in there maybe also. And they're not telling me easily. So, oh, there it is, finding. Oh, 13.5. I'm surprised. Seems to be a little bit more heat there. Uh, than that. But of course, they do have a percent either way they can go uh, to that. But nice little cocoa in the finish. Nice sort of blackberries. Real bright fruit. Really, really nice. Even mulberries. How oh, interesting. Yeah. And a little bit, you know, a little floral. There's a really nice perfume in that wine. Mm. So it makes wine so, so amazingly interesting. A little about this wine. Uh, here we are back in, in this case, we are in Argentina. Uh, and you can see that there, in fact, are major areas. In fact, the, the really the biggest one, there's no doubt, is in the purple. And that's Mendoza. Um, and though, and many people, and I've known many people have gone down there to the Uco Valley. Uh, and it sort of like is the center of this. And we'll talk a little about the Argentine history also um, of this area. Uh, you can see, of course, there's the there's the Pacific, there's Chile, there, of course, is uh, Argentina, uh, sort of uh, right there, again, in the Andes, in many cases, four, five, six, seven thousand feet. Some of the areas actually have, they actually put nets over the vines because they're so high, they get tremendous amounts of sun. And so they can actually shade the, a little bit, but they do that to prevent uh, hail damage because the thunderstorms can be so strong there. And again, you'll get you know hail and hail is just, not only will it kill or will ruin the crop that year, but in many cases, it may be a couple of years before the vine will recover. And so this has always been a problem in there. They grow some grapes up in Salta in the north. And of course, we'll talk about some of the other places, you know, in both Argentina and Chile. Uh, some in Patagonia. In fact, I've had a couple of people, um, I had a student, in fact, who did one of his internships in Patagonia. And another friend of mine, in fact, did a lot of uh, hiking down through that area. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, but again, because of climate change, we are seeing more and more grapes growing further and further south towards the South Pole, uh, in fact, in Argentina. It's sort of really interesting along the side. So that, in fact, is where we are talking about where this grape came from. Again, now, of course, it's you know, the mountains are on the other side now to the west uh, here because we are in Argentina, but you do have the Andes on both sides. Uh, and in fact, for the most part, dry, absolutely beautiful countryside. Just amazing, in fact, to see these mountains and all of this. Uh, in there. Malbec, uh, again, these are just pictures from Alta Vista of their vineyards and all of the area. So really, you know, just again, look at that beautiful, beautiful shots uh, that are there. So very, very nice. Uh, by the way, Alta Vista is actually has uh, sort of uh, 
royal connections almost. This is Count pa uh, Patrick Doulon, their family owned Piper Heidsick, the major uh, champagne house, until it was sold in 1998 uh, to Remy Martin, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so that's, in fact, what happened uh, in there. And so this is, in fact, they obviously had a pile of money. Uh, and so they decided, in fact, originally we're going to make an, I'm not sure if they actually do make, I, I didn't really look to see if Alta Vista makes a sparkling wine, but they actually did go to Argentina with the idea of making sparkling wine. I don't think I've ever had an Argentine sparkling wine. I have no doubt that they do make them, but I don't think I've had one. Uh, sort of interestingly enough, I'll have to check and see if there are any available. So I thought that was interesting how this all goes uh, in there. Uh, again, this is the Malbec uh, grape. Uh, sort of very interesting, in fact, from those standpoint uh, in all of that. Um, Malbec's been around for a long time. I mean, and most people never heard of the grape until Argentina. And as you can see, it was a common grape in medieval France. It grew all over the place. The problem is it doesn't stand rain too well and, uh, you know, in sort of fr early frost. And so it was not favored. And so when phylloxera hit there again in the 1850s, 60s, um, it was simply not replanted. The only, pl uh, in fact, the only place it was planted is in the area which is sort of inland from Bordeaux called Caur. Uh, and there the grape is called Cot. Uh, and it is, in fact, planted in Bordeaux, as you can see, but not even 1% of it is in there. There, I would not be surprised. They've increased the plantings of Petit Verdot in Bordeaux, and they may do the same with Malbec, simply, again, because it's a little warmer, and that's, in fact, what Malbec likes uh, to an extent. So it was taken. It's really interesting. Malbec was in Chile before it was in Argentina. So it's sort of really interesting to see how that works, and you think, Really? Because you think of the Andes Mountains, but what you don't realize, certainly what I didn't realize, so I like doing these things because I learned so much, is that it was much easier to literally go into Chile and then take the grapevines by typically pack mule across the Andes through one of the passes into that part of Argentina rather than trying to get it from Buenos Aires. And so, in fact, many of the things, especially when it came to early wine production in Argentina, came through Chile. And you have to realize, of course, well, they did separate out fairly, fairly early in fact before this, but obviously had okay things. And of course, things were sort of maybe wild west in all of that. Um, and in fact, it was taken to Chile, uh, then to Argentina by a French agronomist. And in fact, he planted the grapes. He, he got his, he got his sort of the patent or the, the ability to start a school on April 17th. And so that is World Malbec Day because of the importance of Malbec in Argentina, as you can see. Um, and in fact, I learned so much. I didn't realize, of course, that Argentina basically, you know, when it was trying to become a country, had like 50 years of civil war. And then they had a fairly uh, time of peace um, in the late in the late 1800s into the 20th century, and then things went, and then of course World War One, and then of course the Great Depression, then World War Two, and then of course the rise of Perón. And at that point in time, the the people in Argentina drank. Uh, there is certainly no question about that. And so. Uh, and they they planted a lot of other grapes, but they did Malbec. In fact, you can see it went from being the champ at 120,000 acres to nothing. Uh, and then because they thought, oh, both wine tourism in those areas and, of course, selling it to the United States and other countries, it now has over 100,000 acres of Malbec uh, that are there. 85% of the world's Malbec is, in fact, in Argentina. Why? Because it really likes that warm dry climate where in fact it's probably in fact irrigated it rarely if ever sees rain so it's sort of interesting along those lines again about this wine uh, manual harvest they were separated in stocks of crusher uh regular pump mass don't maceration don't need to worry about they say red fruit aromas of course they say plum i can see that hints of vanilla um uh 13.5, 25% of the wine is aged in French oak barrels for six months. So it sees a little bit of oak uh, also. And I would imagine that those are probably not first use French oak barrels. So it gives a little bit more roundness, a little bit more character, in fact, to that wine. So really a, a nice little wine. Uh, no question about that. Okay. Questions, Emily? 
Yes, um, we do have some questions. So the first one is, what do you do if a cork or pieces of a cork go into a bottle? Trust me, it can often be a real problem, especially with older corks. In fact, not that I'm, you know, if you happen to have a lot, I mean, very, you know, as many of you know, I have a major role in the um, annual wine tasting that, that is a benefit for the performing arts. And people are kind enough, in fact, over wonderfully generous to give us wines out of their cellars. And in many cases, these wines may be from the 70s and 80s and 90s. And so, of course, cork simply doesn't last that long. Usually we'll get 12 to 15 years out of a cork. But after that, it's a good chance it's going to crumble. I do have, I didn't bring one with me today because all these are young. I do have a wine uh, key uh, that's called a Durand. And it actually has both the worm, which in fact is what you find at the end of the thing, and also has the two prongs for the osso. And so you put both around the cork. And I really have had some fairly good luck in taking that cork out intact. If not, and in fact, when I do this tasting, I bring a strainer with me. You know, I bring a strainer. I will strain out the wine very often, put it into a canter. The thing I will tell you, and don't forget this, especially if the wine is old. You know, sometimes the cork, it may not be good quality, and so it falls apart, it falls apart. But with old wines, if you put it into a decanter, make sure that they get drunk relatively fast. This whole idea of decanting wines, and I can't say I decant a tremendous amount of wines. If the wine is young and big, has a tremendous amount of, you know, possibility of aging, etc., this is a wine that needs to be decanted because... If you give it some air for a couple hours, it's going to soften up those tannins. It's going to make it more drinkable. Older wines can disappear. I remember, in fact, going to a very special tasting, and there were two wines that were quite old. One was decanted. The other was not. And the one that was not still tasted good an hour later. The one that was decanted had fallen apart. And so air will do that. And so older wines should not, for the most part, be decanted. Uh, for any length of time. Uh, young wines, and especially big reds and stuff like that, yes, decant them. It certainly can help. I very often, you know, swirling in the glass. I mean, if it's really expensive, that's a different story. But, you know, for the most part, most everyday wines are perfectly fine from the bottle. So that's what I would do. I just use a strainer, and I use a strainer all the time, you know. And trust me, I probably chewed more than my share of cork fragments. <laughs> All right, and then one more. Sure. Um, are South American wineries embracing the natural wine movement? And then they said also biodynamic, regener regenerative, and other practices. Uh, and actually, that's a good question. And yes, the reason being is it's always, it's of course, it's always interesting. And of course, and they're doing it in many cases for the right reasons. But it's easy to have or use these practices, which is great and that they should, but it's easy to do that when you don't get any rain all year. Because remember, you know, you all know, if you're going to get mildew in a house, it's going to be around the kitchen or in the bathroom or places that are wet. Because of course, most fungi need to have free water. In other words, liquid water, drops of water to in fact infect a plant. If the plant's dry, then you're not gonna have any fungal problems. Also, if it's, it's sort of open, if it's dry all around there, you may not have a place for insects to overwinter. And so consequently, these kinds of practices in places like Chile and Argentina, and you know, and they are, they are very often, in fact, often the forefront of doing all of this, which is absolutely great. Um, and I'll be honest, it's always one of those things that I, I sort of cringe a little um, because I really think, you know, I, you know, not tremendously, obviously I'm not there all the time, but I've interacted with, with people in the wine industry for a long time. And these people care about the environment. They don't want to hurt themselves. They don't want to hurt anyone else. They use as little pesticides or anything like that as possible. And so if you have the ability to do that, you know, that's great, you know, but let's face it, for example, growing grapes in Ohio, Ohio is not the same. Obviously we had that two inches of rain this morning, is not the same as growing without any rain in Chile, Argentina. So they've done a lot of good and they've done a lot of good work and all that stuff needs to be done. Um, 
as much as possible. So yeah, you will find a lot of good wines coming out of those places that in fact are sustainable, biodynamic, all of those things. Next wine? Yep, that's it for this. <laughs> okay, back to screw cap. This is Cabernet. Uh, by the way, reds are big in uh, South America. By the way, one thing I won't mention, I've actually had some, I've had some actually fairly decent wines from Bolivia, and they have now a nascent wine industry. And that's been interesting, especially because obviously they have the mountains. And so if you get up there in good altitude, it's cooler. So it's not so hot in those areas. Another place you would not think of, and I don't, they don't have, at least in my mind, a reputation for making fine wines, but they make some good everyday wines, is actually Southern Brazil. You know, and I guess I should mention while I'm talking about South America, Uruguay is in fact known for a grape called Tanat, which tends to be fairly um, uh, uh, tannic. Uh, you see the word Tanat, tannic in there. Uh, and so, but uh, they make some they make some pretty nice ones. And so you will find wines from a number of countries um, in there. In fact, I actually had a former student, she was in fact talking to me about not being able to find any good wines from Ecuador. But of course, Ecuador has been having more than their share of difficulty Anyway, so anyway, again, with the color of this wine, this is the 1895, a little lighter, I think, than in fact the Malbec um, there. Uh, so if you swirl and smell this wine, mm. darker, uh, bright though, um, mm. elderberries. A little bit, of, you know, there's some, there certainly is a little bit of wood in there. Or at least the aromas are there. Mm. Yeah, but not really coffee. Just sort of more woody. Maybe a little bit of cocoa. But nice, good fruit. Nice, bright fruit. Yeah, black, black raspberries. And of course, you taste this one. Seriously, what's not to like about this wine? It's not expensive, has good grip, not much in the way of um, tannins. Uh, and so you can certainly drink it as is, but make a great food wine. Uh, again, I can see this on the grill, you know, pork chops or, you know, even barbecue, any number of things, chicken, I mean, even chicken with a grilled smoky flavor. I mean, and it's, it's not heavy. It's nice and bright, has good acidity. Um, and so it's just like, gee, I mean, what's not to like? I mean, this, you know, and again, this is just simply not an expensive wine. And yet it drinks so well. Yeah, yes, this is not one, in fact, to, you know, spend two hours contemplating over. Uh, but it is, in fact, a wine to truly enjoy and to drink and to, you know, have with any number of things here in the summer. And of course, I mean, that is enough oomph. It'll go straight through the winter. It's a cab. But nice, bright, light cap. Very nice. Some about this wine. See here. There it is. In fact, this is, in fact, um, get my things here. This is from Norton, Bodega Norton. Uh, one of the one of the major producers, in fact, in Argentina, uh, and you can see, of course, you know the beautiful grounds and the whole bit that is here. There it is, looking out again at the mountains. Beautiful vineyards. You can see them, of course, picking there. In fact, very nicely trimmed vineyards. Yes, beautiful, just beautiful. This is one hundred percent Cabernet uh, from Mendoza uh, again. Uh, ABV, yeah, I'd say 13.7, that feels right. Nice and bright, not too heavy uh, in the oak. Um, just a nice wine. By the way, it's called 1895 because Norton was founded in 1895. And so this is their selection, 1895. It's their entry-level wines, uh, which in fact this is. Uh, because in fact, here I have a Cabernet first, and in fact with two more reds because the other two reds have a little more complexity to them. And so it's one, but wow, easy drinking, just 
really just a nice little wine. So it works very, very with, well with all of that. Uh, by the way, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, uh, Argentina has had a major history when it comes to this. is, of course, a picture of them, in fact, working on the grapes uh, through all of that. Uh, they said the grapes, in fact, came from Chile, um, often, in fact, done through the church. In fact, for a long time, in fact, there was very, very slow growth. And in fact, there was very slow growth until this. This, in fact, was interesting. Two things. Um, they encouraged immigration. Uh, and in fact, that caused, in fact, a lot of differences then at the end of the uh, 19th century, in the late 1800s, because there were, in fact, so many immigrants coming in who wanted, in fact, it was not until the end, I think, of the of the 1800s, uh, where they had, in fact, in fact, might have been actually the early 20th century, before they had universal su suffrage, that, in fact, everybody, in fact, had the right to vote. Uh, and I'm actually even not talking about, you know, not only like here in the United States of women, but in fact, a number of the immigrants, in fact, did not have the right to vote also for a very, very long time. Um, but the railroad made the huge difference because here you are, you know, up in the sticks, you know, let's face it, a couple hundred miles away from the, the coast where you can infect the large population of Buenos Aires and where you can, in fact, move a lot of it, a lot of wine out. And so this, in fact, ended up being the problem. But once the railroad was built in 1885, then, of course, there was a tremendous amount or a tremendous wine boom that happened in all of this. As I mentioned, you know, about the ebb and flow of wine in Argentina. Under the Perón, especially, you know, things went, and for some reason, I don't know if the if the Argentines were trying to drown their sorrows. At one point in time, they had the highest per capita consumption, mainly of this cheap, you know, rosé wine. Speaking of rosés, uh, this Criollo or Pais, uh, as you can see, 96 liters per year. Uh, the problem ends up being because of, you know, economic problems, etc. There was, in fact, a major collapse, as you can see. And, in fact, it's just sort of amazing to see that per capita consumption in Argentina went from practically 100 down to 18 uh, currently today. And so that, in fact, is the problem. As we've already talked about with Malbec, you know, it was they had a tremendous amount of vines. They pulled them up. And now, of course, they're planning because they realize in Argentina that this is tourism capital. And so, in fact, this is really what's going on. Uh, they had certainly a lot of problems with the dirty war, as you remember, uh, and all of that. But they basically followed Chile's lead when it came to foreign investment and moving the wines out. And after the economy collapsed, you know, the wines were inexpensive. And all at once, it's like, oh, all of a sudden you're seeing Argentine Malbecs everywhere. And so a number of other grapes also uh, that were there. And so, you know, tourism has brought a tremendous amount of money. You know, it's interesting, and you may not realize this, but I think in like before the first or maybe right after the First World War, Argentina was like the eighth, fifth or eighth richest country in the world, you know, because of its tremendous amount of beef and soybeans and, and wheat that it in fact exported. And Argentina was in fact really part of Europe almost. You know, all the big liners went to Buenos Aires, you know, the things like, you know, the Titanic or things like of those or ships like that, the Queen Mary, they stopped there. This is why the tango, of course, took in the 20s, took, you know, Europe by storm. It was Argentina uh, that was very, very important. And of course, then they've had more than their share of ups and downs and their current political situation is basically terrible. Uh, in fact, I was just talking to a gentleman about that, an Argentine uh, producer. It's it's a tough time for them, uh, but they're doing everything they can in all of that. But they do know, in fact, in Mendoza in 2018, they had over a million tourists in the area. And so tourism dollar are very important. Interesting enough, you never think about it, 40% of them from Brazil. Of course, it's right there. And so, yeah, so in fact, Brazil has been very important when it comes to, in fact, Tourism, in fact, in all of those areas. So it's sort of amazing to see. And architecture, uh, this is Fournier. I mean, look at this amazing buildings. You know, I mean, some of the ones, you know, some of the best pieces of architecture in the world in what they are doing. And of course, then that attracts dollars and that attracts uh, people to visit and all of this. Here, of course, is Zapata, Catena Zapata, very, very famous with this sort of ziggurat idea. So, you know, it's just, it's interesting to delve into these other countries because so many of them have such an amazing history when it comes to all of this. Questions, Emily? 
Yes. Well, they put people to sleep. So, um, no, I'm not asleep. Someone said, can any wine be a sparkling wine? And should any wine be a sparkling wine? And sorry, I know these aren't super related to the wine. Oh, no, that's okay. No, I mean, I'm glad. I'm. That's no problem. Um, and that's a very good question. First of all, to make a good sparkling wine, almost always, you need to have acidity. The wine has got to have a good freshness to them. Let's face it. Champagne is the perfect example, as I talked about before, of making lemonade out of lemons. Champagne is far to the north, and in many cases, the wine can't, the grapes can't come close to being ripe. So they have lots of acid and not a lot of sugar. And so you put them through these special methods uh, to, in fact, do this. Actually, that's also a good point. You don't want the grapes to be very ripe. The problem is to the bubbles act as a, a carrier for aroma. And so if you have a wine that has a tremendous amount of aroma, it's just going to be like, it's too much. And so you really want grapes that don't have, as, as an underripe grape would, ha would have not a lot of aroma to them. Um, the only red wines that I see at all that are made sparkling are sparkling Shirazes. Uh, and of course, you know, the Australians have made wine and done everything in every way, shape, or form. And so that's what you'll see. I've had some that are okay. I can't say I'm a super fan. So actually the most important thing, because I've had, Lordy, of course you have the mainer ones, you know, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier. But I've had sparkling, certainly sparkling Rieslings. I've had sparkling Sauvignon Blancs. Um, of course, in Spain, they use three of their native grapes, you know, uh, Macabeo, Parrieda, Zarolo, uh, and of course, other grapes. I've had sparkling Chenin Blanc. And so there's lots of grapes, in fact, that I can think of, obviously, right off the top of my head, that in fact can be sparkling. And that's not all of them. Uh, that in fact, it's just sort of a, a small amount that can be there. But typically, and it's great because I've never really thought about this before, acid. Acid would be the key that is what you need to make the wine so it has that good snap uh, that you want of a, of a wine, of a sparkling wine. Having, of course, said that, I think about some of the things like, uh, and of course, you have good asties or things. And again, it depends on the amount of bubbles that you're also putting in the wine. Because again, things like Lambrusco have, you know, they're what the Italians would call frizzante, not very sparkling. Uh, which is fine. It makes them very nice and refreshing. And by the way, for those of you who only grew up on Rio Nidi, uh, there are in fact a lot of good uh, Lambruscos coming out of Italy now by you know people who are, of course are passionate about it. Let's face it. To me, that's what makes wine fascinating. You know, you go to these places and these people are passionate about what they do. I mean, they put their hearts and soul into this into the wine and what they do. And they have a, a vision of what they want. And so, yeah, you can have lots of good wines that are done by, you know, committee and stuff like this. But the really great wines are the ones that are made by those kinds of people uh, that have interesting flavors and stories to tell. I think that's what makes it interesting. Questions? We do have other questions, but I will save them for the end because they're more general. Kidoki. So our next wine do, 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 is, of course, Montes Alpha Carmenier. As I mentioned, Carmenier is that grape that was completely unknown in there. Can I already open this? Whoa, nice dark color. As you can see there, and again, nope, on a white background, yeah, gone. I could try even at the very end, and I can't really read through it. That's what I usually use with my, as, as how the, wow, and the aroma, gee, it just jumps out of that glass. I don't have to swirl at all. It's all there. So if you do swirl and smell this wine, so different sort of vegetal, you know, in other words, having that sort of greenness to it. Actually, it's interesting. I think I've had this wine before. This actually has a little bell pepper. 
which is interesting from Carmenere. When I think of bell pepper, I think of it. It can certainly be uh, Cabernet Franc and some other ones. So yeah, that's really interesting. I don't remember even when the last time I had this wine, hearing, seeing, feeling, or smelling the bell pepper. Some other dark fruits, though, obviously too, and a really almost like sandalwood. You know, really just a almost exotic spice that's in there. Oh yeah, and a little bit of smokiness. Dang, that's interesting. And of course, you smell it, taste this wine. First of all, I love the mouthfeel. It's really silky. It does have, you know, some tannins in the finish. Good acidity. The silkiness. So nice. And it's it's silky. I mean, it's just sort of amazing. Wonderful. Um, has a little bit of what the French would call garrigue. It's, again, it's that herbalness. It's that rosemary, you know, uh, lavender, that mixture of of aromas that I'm getting that are very, very herbal uh, coming out of that wine, especially in the finish. But yet at the same time, there's an underlaying sweetness uh, to that wine that is really quite nice. Now, again, I'm getting a little of that almost smokiness, you know, charcoaly in the finish uh, that is there. And the alcohol... 14.5, and I'm not surprised, but not too bad. It's not out of, certainly not out of balance at all. I'm feeling a little bit of heat, but mm, there's all that wonderful flavor to that wine. Really, really, really nice. A little bit about this wine. Do, 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 do. Uh, there, of course, we are back to, uh, to Chile in the areas. And this is actually in the Colchagua Valley. And so, again, we're going up a step. You have a more, um, a, a smaller area within the Central Valley there, not far from Santiago uh, in there. And so this is, in fact, where those these wines come from. Uh, there, in fact, you see right there uh, where it is in the Central Valley. Uh, by the way, all of those are very, very famous. Uh, the Maipo and the Mole at the bottom uh, probably also, uh, you know, these. This was the place where wine making started in Chile, and so things like Casino Macul and other of uh, the various sort of famous wineries, in fact, are from this area. Even though, of course, in many cases, they have also moved into other regions too. They have the things. Um, very again, we talked about biodynamic. Uh, the use, in fact, of a number of different animals uh, in the vineyard to keep down the plants, to do all of this. And we're finding more and more of that. So it really is interesting. These, in fact, are pictures, in fact, uh, uh, from Montes. Uh, there you can see, of course, them trying to use as much uh, of the native plant material, et cetera, in between the rows. Uh, also very, very important. Just absolutely. I say it in class all the time, and I think of it too. Every time I look at these pictures, like, grapes don't grow in ugly places. You know, it's like, yeah, I'll be happy to go there. I'll be happy to go there. You know, yeah, no problem at all. I was reading an article just recently, completely, also quite, sort of not quite on, off subject, but still, someone asked what superpower that this person could have. And the person said teleportation, thinking, oh, what a great idea. I mean, I curse just driving from my house to, uh, to Kroger. I mean, to be able to teleport yourself anywhere, think what fun that would be. And think about how much time you would save. Good idea. Just so beautiful. This, of course, is all pictures, in fact, from, from Montes uh, that are there. Just absolutely beautiful, beautiful country. Here, of course, is the Carmenere, as you can see from the Colchagua Valley. 50% uh, of this wine was aged for 12 months in first Uke French oak. So, and it's interesting. Yeah, this might be a little bit, but it's got so much fruit and flavor that I don't like. It's like, I don't say, oh, this wine's oaky, because it's it simply isn't. It's there, but it's very, very nicely integrated. Uh, they say, in fact, maybe sell it for 10 or more years. I have no problem with that either. They, they, they actually talk about decanting it for a few minutes, and that's fine. This wine is 90% Carmenier, 10% Cabernet Sauvignon. They probably added the Cabernet because Carmenier tends to be, as you can tell, very spicy and having all this. The 10% Cab 
gives it some more, a little more backbone, a little more oomph. Uh, in fact, this wine that is in there. And so that's what's going on in this wine. Mm, yeah, very, very, very nice. Uh, this is in to critics' note. As you can see, very much the style of house wines, ripe coming here, noticeable notes of oak in which, and I don't really get a tremendous amount of oak. It's there. Aged with touches of toast and sweet black fruits are certainly there. Uh, for charcuterie, they mentioned, say, charcuterie. Blend of two vineyards, the Montes has an apalta, smaller amount from the uh, Marchagui. I'm not sure about saying that. As well as a couple of third-party grape producers. who got 90 points there uh, from a person down in uh, Chile. Okay. Questions, Emily? Yes. Okay. So um, they someone said, would it make sense to warm a red and palm like a liquor to open it up? Good question. It's interesting. Temperature makes a tremendous difference. You know, one of the things I talk about, and you probably all, you know, have experienced, you know, Say, for example, you know, take something out of the fridge or you open a can of soup and you put in the thing and you can hardly smell it. And, of course, once it gets warm, then, of course, you can smell it. Never forget, everything that we talk about when we talk about flavors in wines, we are basically talking about aromas. And so if the wine is too cold, we very often will say the wine's dumb. And that's because you're not getting the aromas. And I can't tell you, you know, if I go someplace, and especially the whites, if they're too cold, you will see me there both hands around it, you know, praying that the wine will open up and show some life. Uh, because at the moment, it's when it's really cold, it's dead. Uh, and so that, in fact, is part of what goes on. And so, yes, if the wine, you know, and very often they say, and of course it makes sense, serve at cellar temperature, which is probably in the low 60s. And so allowing the wine to warm up a little bit will, of course, allow more of the molecules to get into the air, which will then allow you to smell and taste it better. Of course, once it hits your warm, hopefully 98.6 mouth, it's going to warm up and, of course, then give off more aromas and flavors to you. But that, in fact, is what's going on. So, yes, if the wine is too cold, you want to. Now, the opposite. When I came here, because, of course, the wine was at my house and my house was a bit warm today, not surprisingly. Uh, and so, in fact, we threw these bottles into the fridge for like 20 minutes or so, just to bring the temperature down so that they would be, you know, enjoyable. Because I don't want to drink an 80 degree red wine. You know, it just doesn't have it. It, it puts the acid and the tannins all out of whack and all that kind of stuff. And so, yes. So I tend to be not very doctrinaire when it comes to temperature, but temperature makes an importance. And so I will do just those little kinds of things just to make that I sure that, you know, I'm giving the wine every chance it has to really shine through. That is all for this one. Oh, I want to give you one update. Um, yep. We have all the pictures that we took today on campus. So at the end, mm -hmm. I have them in a slideshow, and I can put them up if you want to show people. Okay. What we'll do is we'll do that. Why don't we do yeah, that we first do that after, after we finish the last one? Yeah, let's great. do that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And there's no, there's no, I was thinking too, we didn't talk about this, and so maybe I shouldn't, but about, you know, people sending you pictures of what they're doing around the world, around the country. Sorry. We're ready okay. for the next wine. Yep. <laughs> Whenever you are. Sure. Yep. The next wine, of course, is again Montes Alpha. By the way, no one asks, and so it's interesting. It's like, why the angel? It's nice. It's beautiful. In fact, it's a nice label. But here, um, Montes was founded by several gentlemen um, uh, very uh, from very different backgrounds, too. And one of the gentlemen... Um, who, in fact, has, has since passed away a number of years ago, uh, not from this, though. He ended up um, having, uh, being in, who knows exactly why, they don't, they never explained it, in several car accidents, which he managed, in fact, to walk away from. And so he decided that there was an angel watching over him. And so he felt it very important that Montes have an angel on their label. And so that's why you have this label on the Montes uh, wines. Um, Montes was, in many cases, and then I'll talk about the wine, Montes in many cases was one of those wineries that, that 
sort of were the first wave. In other words, in like the 80s, I think they didn't start, I think the 80s, and I shouldn't know exactly, but they did start, I'm pretty sure, in the 80s. And uh, with four gentlemen who were interested in wine and wanted to, in fact, take Chilean wines up a step. And so that's what they did. They they went together and they began making these wines. And in fact, you may have heard of uh, Purple Angel uh, and a number of other wines, in fact, that, that basically took the world and certainly the um, reviewers by storm. And so they make very, very wines. What we're having, of course, is now their sort of second level above their sort of bottom tier. Uh, and they're just wonderful wines. There's certainly no question about that. But this, is, in fact, is a very interesting, interesting wine company uh, that is there, even though they didn't answer me either when I asked them some questions today. Okay, uh, let's see. I'll go back here. Montes Alpha Syrah. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you can see that, but the wine bottle is completely different. This, of course, is a typical Bordeaux bottle. This is a typical Burgundy bottle, but they usually or very often will put Syrahs in a Burgundy bottle also, which is, or, you know, again, when you drink, yeah, I guess, I have to think myself, Syrah is the grape of the northern Rhone River Valley in um, in France. Uh, and so this, this and that's why, in fact, it's the Hermitage, it's the Cofoti, it's those areas in the northern Rhone that are known, in fact, for the Syrahs. Interestingly enough, in fact, those areas almost disappeared because you know, after the Second World War and in the 50s and 60s, people weren't interested in growing grapes. And in fact, there were not the prices that there are today. And so the acreage in many of these areas went down because it's a lot of work, because it's on hillsides, etc. Now, many of these wines are selling for hundreds of dollars a bottle. And so it's interesting to see how all of this works in many ways. But it was really those wines, as I said, the Hermitage, the Cote Protee, the San Josefs, that in fact put Syrah on the map. Of course, it's the same as Shiraz in Australia. So this is, in fact, in this kind of bottle. I'm sure to remember. Yeah, I think Hermitage, in fact, is in a bottle like this. Whoa, dark, which is not surprising. Syrah probably, Cabernet Sauvignon has more tannic, has more tannins, but probably no grape has practically more color than Syrah. Uh, and especially when you think this wine probably came from an elevation of 4,000 feet where the sun is beating down on it. So then you're going to get a tremendous thick skins and a tremendous amount of color basically to protect the grapes uh, you know, with that because they, re they respond to the environmental conditions that are there. So quite, quite dark, yes, opaque. You could write with it. And of course, if you swirl and smell this wine, Ah, oh, nice, sort of fleshy, you know, has a, has a, a roundness to it. Dark, dark, you know, boy, you know, a little cocoa and coffee. Deep fruits, plum, I think more than anything else. Very often when I think of Syrah, I think of blueberries. A little bit of black pepper, which is not unusual also in Syrah. But, oh, just those dark, just sort of cocoa, tobacco, all of those things going on in that wine. And, of course, you taste this wine. Mm. Again, not tannic. There's obviously tannins there, but there's so much fruit. They just simply blows the tannins out of the water. I mean, it's just like, wow. So wonderful flavors. Clean, good acidity. And it's that, I'm not exactly sure. You know, obviously there's oak there. And so you're getting some of those flavors, but it's really, they're really smooth and really very nice. Also a fair amount of alcohol. I would guess 14.5. Yep, 14.5 um, to that. Hmm. This, again, 
you could still, because it's not heavy and there's not too much tannin, you could certainly use this in the summertime. But this is this is a, this is a big wine. Uh, again, not surprising as we go along, we start with the lightest and go to the heaviest. And this is certainly a big wine. A little bit about this wine. Do, 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 do. Oh, sorry, went too fast. This is uh, the grape. This, of course, is Syrah, Shiraz. Uh, again, a major, major grape, as I mentioned, from, from in fact, northern, um, uh, northern Rhone re River region. Here's another picture, of course, of the Montes uh, vineyard or, or room. A little bit more of their vineyards there. Again, just amazing to see. This is actually one of the few pictures I actually have found because, in fact, I wrote Montes. Hopefully, they would answer me because I would like, I would have loved to have seen exactly what the vineyards look like now. And I thought it would be interesting for you to see what the vineyards look like now. But unfortunately, they did not get back in touch with me uh, in time, in fact, to do that. So, but that's just sort of the way it goes. But again, they are dormant at the moment. They, in fact, will be coming out of dormancy. As we're going into dormancy, they will be coming out of dormancy. And so this is, in fact, and of course, this is why in the wintertime, you would, of course, see lots of snow on the mountain because it's winter down there. And so it's sort of interesting, in fact, to see. So this is Montessorel. It's also from the Colchagua Valley, as you can see. What's interesting, too, you notice, in fact, they actually tell you what the clonal selections are. Clones... You know, again, you probably you know, know from Star Wars, the Clone Wars and stuff like this. A clone means you have the exact same plant. And what you find is in many grape varieties, in fact, many plants, that you will have a lot of variation between, you know, one plant versus another. This one has bigger berries. This one has a different, slightly different flavor. And so you have a lot of differences in there. And so what they've done is, and continue to do, is find certain plants that they think are superior in some way. And so they will then take cuttings, so you have the exact same plant, and they will take cuttings and make many, many, many of clones of the exact same plant. And so that's you're looking here too. It's a clone 99, 100, 174, 304, 70. So there's actually a lot of different clones of Syrah, which is interesting. Pinot Noir is probably the, the plant, the grape variety that has the most clonal selection in there. Um, tell you the uh, filtering car cartridge filters. I really should have looked that up, but I have no idea what they're talking about. That vineyard yield 2.8 tons to the acre is low. I mean, that really is in fact low. Part of it, of course, this is also 2020. And so, again, dealing with difficulties, they've had heat waves like everybody else has. They've had lots of problems with this, but they still made a wonderful wine. But 2.8 tons to the acre is quite, quite low. Um, this is also interesting. This wine is 90% Syrah, it's 7% Cabernet Sauvignon, which you would expect if they wanted to give it a little bit more backbone, as we talked about before. But look at that. The other thing in this wine, in fact, now it makes me want to go back, and, and even though I knew this, it makes me want to go back and smell it again. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It's 3% Viognier. Viognier is another, it's a white grape. Believe it or not, they put 3% of a white grape into this. And in fact, in the Northern Rhone, it was not unusual for them to add a few percentage of Viognier's because white wines tend to have more aroma. They're much more aromatic in those bright aromas, you know, that are there. And so some of that bright aroma that you get out of this wine comes from the Viognier. There's really no question at all. Again, barrel aging, 55% of this wine were 12 months now, longer time in French oak barrels, uh, first, second, and third. So they actually used either a barrel that has never been used, a barrel that's used once, or a barrel that's used twice. And so then they have different amounts of oak that then they can sort of blend together to make exactly the wine that they want to make. And so that's what that, in fact, comes from. Uh, by the way, this wine got 93. Uh, deep row, deep nose full of tarry blackberries, ground dark peppercorns. We talked about that. Dark spices, certainly there, dried meat, some black, some dried Mediterranean herbs. I certainly get some of that. Cocoa powder, two dark fruits and spices seep with a medium to full body palate. Chalky tans, a long, creamy finish. You certainly get that. Consistently a great value, Syrah from Cochagua. 
So that, in fact, are the wines or the review, in fact, from James Sutton. Questions, Emily? Oops, there we go. Yes, and was this our last wine? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll oh, ask- I don't have any more bottles in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask some of the more general questions. Okay. Um, so someone wants to know, would you use a good wine for cooking with or is cheap wine just as good? Yes, cheap wine is just as good. Um, of course I have, you know, the things, you know, I cook with wine, sometimes it goes into the food. Um, and it's because the heat will very often take away, you can use a very good wine and, you know, once it's cooked, it is gone. So no, you don't want a, a quote unquote bad wine, uh, but you, but yes, an everyday wine, um, <laughs> I'll give you an example. As many of you know, I do an open house for my wines class. And as many of you also possibly know, I make beef bourguignon. And so, um, and typically I have people come and help me, thankfully, since several times I've had 160 people at the house. Uh, and so I go downstairs and I try to find wines that I think are either not real good or possibly maybe a little long of tooth over the hill uh, that we can use. And so what we do is we I will bring the bottles upstairs and usually there's three or four other people there that are helping me work and friends. And so you open the bottle and of course you pour a little bit. You decide, is it too good to cook with? And so we'll just drink it. Or is it like, oh, it's still okay, but oh yeah, we'll cook with that. And so yeah, lesser wines, no question. Do not waste a good wine in cooking. And that's true because, you know, and it's always nice to have a little letter of wine, you know, a little white wine going into risotto or things. I'll tell you the truth, a little hint here. Um, I find that I had a, several, a, several bottles of Fino Sherry. Well, Fino Sherries to a great extent are a, um, a learned uh, flavor that you like. And I like them, in fact, very much. But I had some extras. An ounce or two of that, like to deglaze a, de de a pan or whatever, is wonderful. And, you know, and having those wines to do those kinds of things is just, I mean, it makes all the difference. And so, yeah, I've actually gone through several bottles of Fino recently in various kinds of cooking. Because a couple ounces, you don't really taste it. It just adds a nice background flavor. So, yeah. Cheap wine is the way to go. Good, cheap wine, but cheap wine. Other questions? Yes. Um, have you ever made homemade wine? And if you have, would you recommend it? I have not. My problem has been, in fact, I, I have I'm funny that you say this because, you know, obviously I ran the Green Noses for a long time and I taught many classes. And of course I continue to white classes. I, as I said, you know, make wine. I'm lucky I have time to take my tomatoes and make sauce. Uh, and because it does take time to make wine and to do a good job. So yes, I leave it to the experts. And luckily, so many of the people I know do a great job. So yeah, I don't, I haven't made wine. I'm actually in the process of trying to make vinegar. So we'll see how that turns out. It's been going on. I don't have any idea. Time goes so fast three months now so we'll see how my vinegar turns out all right and then our last one of the evening um other than general availability how do you select the wines for these tastings well uh, you know very often i will try to come up with a theme um in fact as emily and i were talking i think this is the 20th one that i have done uh and so it really is nice to have a theme and so that's why and i'll be honest you know, well, no, nothing, you know, very often I work with one of the distributors who is a great guy and easy to work with. And he was, you know, having some difficulties and things were too busy. And so I didn't want a burden on him. And so this is why with today, I approached another person about getting these wines. Um, and it's wines, I think, you know, does it match the season? Does it match you know, sort of what we want to do. Is there other sort of ideas that we can have? And by the way, somebody wants to give me ideas or something I would like to do, it's no problem. I, you know, I'm certainly not, 
you know, it's like, oh no, I'm going to decide this. No, if it, it's, it's like with cooking. I'm always telling people, what would you like to have? Because half the time, half the problem is figuring out what you're going to cook uh, for me. And so, and so, yeah, so that's, so it can be any number of things. And in fact, it's funny, Emily and I have not talked, but it's like, okay, I'm thinking, you know, maybe we do something sort of early November so it doesn't mess up with the holidays and that kind of stuff as we're getting into the next year and then trying to figure out, okay, what should we do? And it could be a country, you know, we could just do all Italian wines, which would be fine with me because there are just so many wines to try. So I don't have any sort of like, oh, this is what we're doing this time. If someone suggests something, it's like, oh, okay, fine, let's do it. That sounds like fun. All right, those are all of our questions for tonight. Okay, so do you want to show, um, uh, JJ Slager took a bunch of pictures today of the uh, of what's going on at the university. And so these are some pictures, in fact, that he had. Uh, this is, and you want to talk about a gigantic building. This is, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, the new uh, sort of medical arts center. Uh, in fact, I have hearing aids and I had gone up there to the third floor, now to the new digs for the speech and hearing clinic. And it is truly an amazing building and gigantic. You could easily get lost. Uh, again, here is, we had Oh, Lord, we may have had as much as two inches of rain today. And so here's the duck pond. And of course, it was full of water and is full of water right now because it rained a lot. Campus is green. In fact, everywhere is green. And the soybeans and the corn look absolutely fantastic in the area because we have had a good summer. Coomer, of course, always quite lovely over there in Western. Look how green the lawns are. It's really great to see. And of course... Uh, the cheerleaders, I think they had told me uh, that they were there, in fact, across from Shriver uh, that were there. And, of course, uh, hydration stations, which were so important uh, today, also important. Uh, and, of course, you know, the uh, to look again, I think that, in fact, is the library. And, of course, the band was working. And so there are all the people there. Uh, and, of course, uh, beta, or not Beta Bells, but the bells down there, the pulley tower, uh, there on the side. And of course, people moving in everywhere. So it really was. It was really sort of, sort of interesting to see. Of course, this is Move in Miami, and so that's exactly what's going on here at campus. And so it certainly may remind you of the time you moved in if you came here to school. Is that all of them, Emily? Nope. There we are. The formal gardens. I'm not sure exactly what's there. I was not there, so if it. Fewer flowers than I'd hoped, but I will look. It could have been the rain. And, of course, Pearson, where I was, in fact, for a number of years uh, there, too. And, of course, in front of Farmer and the wonderful trees that are there on campus. Uh, so quite, in fact, nice in there. Oh, I missed all these. Oh, again, into, well, uh, what used to be Bishop Woods. Yep. These are pictures I'm actually seeing for the first time. Elian Stoddard, of course, Lewis Place. And of course, Slant Walk. So campus, much as probably many of you remember. There's another wonderful article, in fact, if you saw that, uh, that the, uh, 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 about a woman who in fact was moving her daughter into the exact same dorm room, I think in Emerson, that she in fact had stayed in. Um, so, since I didn't have pictures, and I will do all through these very, very fast, I thought I would show you pictures from my house very quickly. And so that's, in fact, what I'm going to do. Uh, just because some of the things that I do, uh, as many of you probably know, I, of course, run the greenhouses. And so those are my amazing eggplants. I have four of them in pots. And I've probably gotten about 70 eggplants off of four plants. It's amazing. And, of course, my hummingbird feeders. Uh, flowers, you know, because I ran the greenhouses, my deck is covered with flowers. And this orange hibiscus has been absolutely amazing. Um, I finally, it only took me three years, um, put in a raised bed with, of course, deer fencing. And so that's what you're seeing there. My wonderful new raised beds, uh, which are wonderful. By the way, I say all this, you know, if you're in Oxford, come visit. I, I welcome visitors. 
They're in fact are my tomatoes, which are now well over six foot tall. In fact, I've got to get out there tomorrow and string them up for the third time again. Um, and my bocce court. I built a bocce court. I can't get people to come and play bocce. So if you want to come into town and play bocce, it is really great fun. My family did it, and we had an absolute blast. I love to play bocce. And flowers, uh, Brooks Monsias, Angel's Trumpets are favorites of mine. And so if you come to my deck, or certainly for years and years, you will find this. Here's a double yellow. There's a double pink. There's another one's in fact, at night. Uh, again, just wonderful. In fact, beautiful, beautiful flowers. Only smell at night absolutely amazing. I've got the garden club coming soon, in fact, to my things. And of course, this is a morning glory that opens in the evening and literally opens. You can watch it. It will go from completely closed to completely open in like two minutes. It is absolutely an amazing flower to watch. And of course, my tropicals, um, I garden. In fact, I feed people all the time. And so this is a group that was just, in fact, a former student and current students who, in fact, were on my deck uh, there. And, of course, I also feed everything. This is, in fact, a hummingbird. The hummingbirds have been absolutely crazy this year. You can see four in that picture right there. So I have been feeding them and going through sugar like there's no tomorrow. Uh, and, of course, not only do I feed the birds, I feed the butterflies, etc. And, of course, the other thing I always show people is, of course, Jack Cellar. And so, in fact, this is my wine cellar where a portion of the wine I have, uh, uh, I have. Come come drink, please. Of course, I took these pictures on the way to Merstein today. This, of course, was the gaggle of students going through uptown. I was stopped when, in fact, I took that picture. And then, of course, there's a, those gentlemen right at the corner of Spring and um, Maine uh, playing beer pong. And so I thought, what better way to remind you of Miami University and end except on that note. So we started with Andale Andale. So now it's basically get out of here. And thank you from me and the Miami University Alumni Association, and especially those who in fact have given to move on my move in Miami. Thank you very much. Anything else, Emily? Um, no, just thank you so much to you, Jack. Um, for joining us tonight. And thank you to everyone that tuned in and asked questions. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. We had a lot come in. Um, so we apologize if we did not ask what you sent. Um, I hope you all had a great time. Um, just a quick reminder that we are still fundraising for Move in Miami in honor of the class of 2027. So um, they moved back to campus today. It was a great day. Campus was busy. It was so fun to see everyone back. Um, I just heard noises outside. I looked, I thought maybe there were fireworks going on. I know there's a block party, so it's a lot of fun um, to be here. So you can still make a gift um, to the cause of your choice by visiting www.moveinmiami.org and have a great rest of your week into your weekend and love and honor.